When our pollution laws were crafted, they made certain assumptions which have subsequently proven to be partial or even incorrect. First, that pollution-related illnesses were primarily acute. We know now that the most pernicious health threats are those that create chronic problems. Second, that pollution was essentially local. We know now from our study of acid rain and global warming that long-range transport can be critical, not only to a distant part of the country, but to the survival of the planet. Third, that pollution tended to be concentrated and to come out of smokestacks and pipes. We now know that the diffuse sources, such as runoff or the volatile organic compounds that seem to come from everywhere, can be the most difficult to control. And fourth, when a pollutant moved from one medium to another, we sometimes allowed ourselves to believe we had eliminated it. We know now that removing a pollutant from the water only to have it turn up in the air makes it even more difficult to capture. An example of, those, of this is those PCBs that are now turning up in the Great Lakes from air deposition. Another is the fate of pollutants entering wastewater treatment plants. A typical plant controls only half of the toxics that enter it. 15% end up on land as sludge, 20% escape into the air, and the remaining 15% are discharged back into the water. The son of one of my EPA colleagues, Bill Rosenberg, grasped precisely the cross-media nature of pollution when he commented on the Alaskan oil spill. He said, so the problem, as I understand it, is that the oil, which was intended to end up in the air, has instead ended up in the water. Well, in laboring over this problem, we are really trying to find a way to take a more coherent, a more integrated view of the environment and of risk. The truth is that our laws sometimes get in the way. Under the existing environmental programs, each with its own statutory mandate, we have no mechanism, indeed we have no authority, to compare environmental risks across programs and to concentrate on those areas where we can realize the greatest benefits for human health and the integrity of natural systems. Let me quote my predecessor, Lee Thomas, on this point. The single medium approach is set like concrete in the practical day-to-day -day administrative operations of EPA. As administrator, I must protect each individual medium as the law directs. While I may consider other media in so doing, no statutory phrase tells me to look at the environment as a whole and control pollution so as to allow minimum negative effect on public health and other environmental values. As EPA's aptly named 1987 report, Unfinished Business, points out, EPA's priorities appear more closely aligned with public opinion than with estimated risk. Opinion polls, for example, show relatively little public concern for the environmental or health risks of global warming or indoor air pollution. Yet we know these to be potentially among the most serious problems we face. You need not agree with the methodology or all the detailed findings of unfinished business to agree with its broad conclusions. As a case in point, consider how rarely efforts have been undertaken to address the fundamental questions posed by the unfinished business study. What are our overall environmental priorities and how ought we go about acting on them? We have set our pollutant and medium-specific goals over the last 20 years without ever addressing our overall environmental quality objectives. We didn't assess the effects on ecosystems and human health from the total loadings of pollutant deposited through different media, through separate routes of exposure and at various locations, in the home, on the job, in between. We have never been directed by law to seek out the best opportunities to reduce those loads and exposures in toto or the most cost-effective way of proceeding. Given the daunting litany of environmental challenges, how can we do better? For the near term, I think we must first recognize the practical problems we face in trying to get ahead of the environmental power curve. We operate under nine primary statutes and many lesser ones, but we have no basic organic legislation 
to provide us with a broad overall mandate to protect the environment and human health. Because the separate environmental laws arose at different times and in response to different crises, congressional responsibility is also fragmented. I don't know what it was when you ran the agency, Russ, but on Capitol Hill today, 11 full House and 9 full Senate committees and up to 100 subcommittees share environmental jurisdictions. In recent sessions, EPA officials have testified more than 100 times a year on the Hill, and the pace has only quickened in 1989. It's already in excess of 150 appearances, 20 of them by me in just the 10 months I've been in office. None of this is conducive to seeing the environment as a whole. Between the Hill and the courts, EPA is complying or trying to comply with some 800 mandated deadlines and agency personnel are preparing more than 100 reports and studies for Congress, about half of which are required on a regular basis. And we're also getting about 5,000 inquiries from members of Congress. As those numbers suggest, Tending to the business of implementing our environmental laws is becoming extremely cumbersome. I've already begun to feel like the white rabbit in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, always late for some important date. Or like the overworked shipping clerk wearing a t-shirt that reads, the hurrier I go, the behinder I get. And so the goal, the vision, if you will, that I want to propose for the third environmental decade is this. Let's create a new generation of environmental responses, including new laws and new institutions that are capable of meeting the environmental challenges of the next decade and the next century. Public officials, environmentalists, all of us as citizens need to help our society refocus its perspective so that instead of seeing the environment in pieces, we see it whole, as in fact it really is. Such an effort implies that instead of continuing to add more and more discrete authorities as new problems arise, we should begin to integrate our efforts to sustain environmental quality. It implies further that we should begin moving from piecemeal efforts at controlling pollution to a more effective strategy of pollution prevention. Now, when I talk about integrating our efforts, I'm not talking about mere organizational realignment. Instead, I'm talking about taking a more comprehensive look at the environmental challenges we face and determining the best ways to address them. I want to propose tonight that we look more boldly and more broadly toward legislation and environmental policies focused on achieving the following five objectives. First, preventing pollution instead of transferring it to other less protected parts of the environment. In so doing, we should have equally strong regard for both human health and the integrity of natural systems. Second, setting priorities based on risk reduction, focusing our resources to achieve the greatest possible reductions in risk to human health and also to the environment. Third, reflecting environmental priorities in policies for other sectors. Energy, transportation, and agriculture are the obvious candidates. Fourth, allocating our resources most effectively so that we as a society obtain pollution control and environmental quality as economically as possible. This is especially important given the magnitude of the expenditures that may be required. And it is consistent with environmental quality objectives per se for instance, our interest in minimizing adverse impacts overall from a factory, as opposed to putting on separate expensive controls which may reduce pollution in one medium but increase it in another. And finally, ensuring the administrative consistency and practicality of our environmental programs so they achieve their intended goals more rapidly and more predictably. There are two approaches that I think provide practical illustrations of the new orientation I'm suggesting. One exists as a 
draft statute crafted at the Conservation Foundation by Terry Davies, now Assistant Administrator at EPA for Policy Planning and Evaluation. The second is the recently promulgated National Environmental Policy Plan for the Netherlands. In the Dutch plan, economic and growth targets are laid out and pollution reduction goals are committed to. The Netherlands is a small, very densely populated country with some very serious pollution problems. Even so, or perhaps uh, as a consequence, really, the goals of the plan for the year 2010 are breathtaking. CO2 down 20 to 30 percent, SO2 down 80 to 90 percent, NOx down 80 to 90 percent, methane down 80 to 90 percent, hydrocarbons down 80 percent, discharges to the Rhine and North Sea down 75 to 90 percent, and so on. And they have begun to allocate a proportion of their gross national product and to seek the implementation measures to suggest that they are very serious about these goals. Incidentally, I asked the Dutch Environment Minister, Ed Nipples, what the reaction of the various sectors of Dutch opinion was to these proposals, to the Dutch plan. And he said that uh, organized labor expressed some concerns about the possible impacts of this plan on employment, but they support the plan. And manufacturers have criticized parts of the plan, but they now publicly embraced it as well. The official reaction of Dutch environmentalists, uh, I thought was the best. It was, uh, the plan is too little and too late. Uh, they're serious, those guys. Uh, met a lot of them in Nordweg. The Dutch plan relies on five elements to achieve these goals. Extended energy conservation in the household and business sector. Shifts from private car use to public transport. More efficient use of minerals in agriculture. Recovery of raw materials from waste streams. And large-scale application of process-integrated clean technology. I mention the Dutch plan and the Conservation Foundation draft statute because I want to stimulate a new debate about the fundamentals of environmental protection. We need to make, to make the effort, I think, starting now, to look past the daily problems and crises and to develop long-term strategic plans to address the environmental challenges that confront us. We have, in fact, begun that process at EPA. All of our programs are now putting together strategic four-year plans to help us think through our goals, identify ways that we can assess our progress, make strategic choices, and apply those decisions to budget commitments. Never before have so many people been so dedicated to the cause of environmental protection and renewal. In NRDC and other outstanding environmental organizations throughout the country and throughout the world. Never before have international leaders recognized, as they did at the Economic Summit in Paris last July, the interrelationship between economic well-being and environmental well-being. While I was in Europe earlier this month, I headed the U.S. delegation to the Dutch Ministerial Conference on Atmospheric Pollution and Global Warming, or and climate change, excuse me, <clears throat> and then spent several days in West Germany meeting with officials there. I was in the Bundestag to hear Chancellor Kohl deliver that historic speech on East and West Germany when he said of his country, we are not wanderers between East and West. The next evening, I watched those unforgettable images of East Germans streaming over and around the Berlin Wall and speaking with great joy and deep emotion of Freiheit, freedom. In the 1960s, I served as an army officer in Germany with responsibilities for providing security along that border. How the world I knew then is changing now. We in the United States and Europe are turning from the 
overwhelming preoccupation with security and defense. To the tasks of environmental restoration and planetary restabilization. A principal reason that we now can consider this transition is the great success of our economies and of our military alliance. The next great challenge to the creativity and resourcefulness of our free societies will be to secure the ecological base on which long-term economic prosperity depends. And we know that if we are to deal with the environment in a coordinated way, and we really have no alternative if we hope to be fully effective, we must build policies and institutions that are better suited to the task. That won't be easy, intellectually or politically, but difficulty doesn't excuse inaction. The Czechs have a saying, he who is afraid of the forest cannot go in. Ours is the generation that must transform fear of the forest into love of all nature and into cooperative efforts to protect our world and all the life it nurtures while there is still time. Thank you very much. Right now, uh, Bill has uh, agreed to answer a few questions. Madam. I'd like to ask one thing. Where does population fit into the picture that you're painting? The question is, where does population fit into all of this? Well, I don't think, frankly, I don't think, frankly, that we will ever satisfactorily resolve most of the pressing environmental problems in many of the countries of the world if we don't address population, if they don't address population. All the way back. You. Mm -hmm. Mr. Riley, you made the obligatory disclaimer about the deficit and the need to cast all of your programs in terms of that deficit. But, you know, we are still the richest country in the world. And if the American people are not prepared to pay a little bit more in taxes to protect their environment, what are they willing to pay for? It seems to me that a person of your stature, uh, certainly within government circles, ought to be making this point wherever possible, that we can't do this on the cheap. It's going to cost us a lot of money to save our environment. And constantly falling back on this no new taxes refrain, it seems to me, puts an artificial uh, handcuff on you that uh, will make it very difficult to achieve the kinds of objectives that you so nobly and so honorably articulated tonight. Everybody hear that question? I guess so. <laughs> well, uh, here, here, I can tell you that uh, a lot of um, ministers of the environment from other countries have great difficulty with the uh, economic plight that we sometimes plead in the United States as a rationale for not making environmental commitments. Some months ago, the London Economist had an article in which they predicted that within some years, at least a fifth of all revenues raised, at least in the, developing world, in the developed world, would derive from fees or taxes on pollution. I must say that uh, I found that article fascinating and uh, have the sense that to the extent we can build the kinds of incentives, design the incentive systems that I talked about that achieve our environmental objectives. I hope so. The uh, proposed fee that we have uh, set out this year on chlorofluorocarbons of $1.10, I think it is, a pound for a product that sells for about a third that, I think is um, or ought to be seen as a precedent. And we ought to look for other opportunities to do the same kind of thing. We will quickly find, if we do, I suspect, that, uh, that we have nothing like the size of uh, financial um, obstacle that we have heretofore believed we have and that the no new taxes uh, commitment uh, places on us. I'm encouraged to hear your, your talk of taking a more system-wide look at environmental problems. Um, however, as an, as an observer of EPA, um, I've found that there are often problems where one office doesn't know what the other office is doing and energy and time and money is wasted. Is that problem recognized internally and is anything being done to... Well, that's pretty much the premise of my talk. Uh, 
Sure. It's a large organization. It uh, is one in which the particular programs have responsibilities for policies which sometimes are, uh, are, are conceived, crafted, administered in relative isolation from other policies. That is a problem I think that um, my immediate predecessor uh, addressed with increasing success. It's one that will always be there given the complexity of the programs that we administer and the different committees we report to and constituencies and the rest. Uh, increasingly, I think we're, we're getting a handle on that problem, but it is one that is endemic, really, to some of the statutes we administer. And that essentially is my point. Uh, one of the most satisfying things I think I've done in my time is to participate in the proposal to reduce by 10 million tons the sulfur oxide, sulfur dioxides uh, generated in this country from a 1980 base number, and then keep the uh, limit on into the indefinite future with a cap permanently on the amount of SO2 that can be generated here. That, it seems to me, looking at total loadings in the environment, may well be a model for approaches we take to other problems as well. That has not been the approach, typically, that, uh, that we've taken heretofore. And, and yet it's one that I think uh, should prove very effective to develop and then to police. Uh, it's essentially what the Dutch are doing in many areas across their environmental spectrum. And that's the kind of thing I'd like to see more attention to. I think we begin to unify a lot of our efforts. Yes? also suggested an idea of uh, trying to factor in environmental costs into its national, a country's national accounting. Do you think this is a feasible idea, could be implemented within, say, 10 years, especially for a government that has a hard time passing a budget in a normal year? <laughs> Everybody hear that? The uh, question is, the economists also suggested developing a system of national income accounts that acknowledge environmental effects and environmental ecological degradation and would it be possible perhaps to do the same, to do that uh, in a near term. I, uh, I must say that it has always seemed to me that uh, it's simple common sense that we should acknowledge that degrading ecological systems, mining the basis on which forests, farms, uh, long-term productivity of a country depends is not a productive thing to do economically and it seems to me that only economists have had difficulty somehow recognizing this insight I say that as a lawyer modestly uh, but economists have been working and uh, particularly at World Resources Institute I know an effort is going forward to try to develop a system of accounts that do factor that in and do factor in to account for example the, the fact that in Indonesia the rate at which forests have been uh, felled and are being felled over the years is finally going to reduce the viability of that country economically. Even though each year as it happens, the felling of those forests results in a positive impact on the environment. Well, that just, I think, suggests on its face that something's wrong with those accounting systems. If we could make the breakthrough and get a system of accounts and get the World Bank to do a report annually a world environment report that might compare in prestige and, uh, and authority in the developing world to what its world development report now has, I think it would be a tremendous contribution to solving a lot of the problems we're concerned about in the developing world especially. Many have said that there's little that this country will be able to do in many areas in the environment as long as the price of petroleum products is so artificially low, at least on the world market. Is there anything that EPA can or could do in that area? Well, we uh, are certainly now committing to work very closely and have been invited to work very closely in the development of the National Energy Strategy with Secretary Watkins. Conservation, I am confident, will play a large role in that policy. I'm going to participate with Secretary Watkins and Dr. Bromley, the President's Science Advisor, in a couple of weeks in a hearing down in Atlanta. And I understand that the series of hearings the Secretary has held around the country have produced no more um, common and um, vocal response than the emphasis on conservation. That's what has been heard coast to coast. How we respond to that is uh, something we have not yet determined, but uh, ways in which we can reduce our consumption of fossil fuels obviously are uh, very appealing. The uh, West Germans simply do not understand why 
uh, we who produce 22 tons of CO2 per capita cannot manage to reduce those outlays significantly, and they who produce 12.8 tons per capita can and are prepared to. Well, obviously, many of the answers to those problems must lie in energy conservation and reducing our fossil fuel consumption, and I hope that we can do that. All the way back now. Uh -huh. On the status of the Great Lakes, I wonder if you could convey a similar idea on our old Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I think I heard you, you spoke. Uh, I spoke about uh, the Great Lakes, and you said uh, something similar about back to our own Chesapeake Bay. Well, the Chesapeake Bay uh, of the Chesapeake Bay, much the same can be said. I think the element that has been new in Chesapeake Bay in the last several years is the involvement of states that previously had not played a role. It was very important when the Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, Lieutenant Governor Scranton, began to get engaged and to recognize that the contribution of uh, Pennsylvania farmers was uh, an important contributor to the chemicals and pesticides that were increasingly accumulating in the Chesapeake Bay. By the same token, the Governor of Virginia began to uh, get engaged, and Virginia is much more involved now in efforts to improve the Bay than ever before. So we see the same kind of coming together of the jurisdictions that uh, in the past had not cooperated, in many cases not even recognized the priority, the urgency of the problem. We are, uh, uh, I remember my, I think one, one point that uh, was it Bill Ruckelshaus told me about EPA, he said, don't forget Chesapeake Bay. It's the only popular thing you'll ever do, is involve yourself in trying to clean up Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> I've taken that to heart. In two weeks, we're going to get the Chesapeake Bay Council, which I chair together, including the governors of the adjacent states, look at the strategy that has been in place, try to assess what progress we've made, and, and determine priorities for the future. <laughs> What do you see as EPA's role in preserving biological diversity? Now, we have been uh, consulted regularly on the issues of biological diversity conservation. The, uh, the president has done that, and uh, we have uh, entered into a new memorandum of understanding with the Peace Corps to train uh, Peace Corps uh, representatives. I think uh, in a couple of years we will be training more than half of them each year some 7,000 Peace Corps people, in all manner of uh, means of protecting various ecological systems, groundwater, reforestation is one of the programs we're working on with them. And uh, we also have, as you may know, developed a report on the effects of climate change, which uh, in my, to my knowledge was really unique in focusing on the impact on wildlife, on both animal life and plant life, and on the difficulty that they will have adjusting to changes in the environment, in the temperature, in the aridity, and uh, water. Uh, they'll have access to food supply and the rest when such changes occur rapidly, whereas previously they've evolved to their environments and habitats over eons. We uh, are trying to give a much higher priority now at EPA to ecological systems. This is one of the uh, five principal goals that I have, priorities that I have for my time. I think we have become very concerned about, properly concerned about human health impacts over the years. Most of our statutes, much of the attention focused on the agencies, on the agency is directed at that. But we perhaps lost some of the earlier emphasis on natural systems, on groundwater, on uh, estuaries, on wetlands, on coastal resources, and the like. I want to reclaim that and uh, elevate it to a situation of parity with human health. And we're moving in a number of areas in the no net loss of wetlands proposal in, the, uh, in a re recent memorandum with the Corps of Engineers, which dovetails precisely our two approaches to proposals to alter wetlands and uh, hopefully have a longer term impact on conservation of these uh, biotic resources. Mm -hmm. Tom? Bill, I was wondering, does the White House and the administration know of your plans as you've outlined them in the speech? <laughs> and will they support? They know now, John. <laughs> and do you think you can gain their support on the creation of a cabinet-level office, reorganization of laws, and how far have you taken your, dis your ideas in terms of discussions? Everybody hear that? Uh, we have uh, had extensive 
conversations about the future direction of our environmental policies, about EPA priorities, about the longer term that I see over the next several years, about our strategic plans. And I think there is broad understanding and support within the administration for doing a number of the things that I, I suggested. Uh, several of them obviously have not been thoroughly vetted and thought out. They are uh, uh, more in the nature of ideas that need to generate momentum and excitement and attention and analysis within the agency before we go further with them. But I am confident that, um, that we will be successful in the broad lines of, of what I'm proposing. Some of the initiatives in the Clean Air Act I see as altogether novel. The, uh, I think the cap on sulfur dioxide emissions is one of those things, a permanent commitment to keeping a level of pollution down in the United States. Alternative fuels to uh, clean up the air in some of the nation's dirtiest cities. The trading system that vastly improves the cost effectiveness of our acid rain controls. I think we're going to be able to do a lot that blazes new trails and I expect to, uh, to have support. I've certainly had it in the 10 months that I've, I've been at the agency and I've had it from the president. As to cabinet status for EPA, that is uh, not one on which, on which I've uh, made any noise, frankly because uh, I don't think I could have more support were I in the cabinet than I have had from the president being out of it. Uh, the uh, chairman, I think it was, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee questioned me about cabinet status when I came back from the summit. And I pointed out to him that every other head of government or head of state in Paris at the summit uh, did, in fact, as he suggested, have as environment minister a member of his cabinet. But I was the only one who was taken to the summit. First time in 15 summits that any president has ever taken an environment minister to an affair normally reserved for foreign ministers and finance ministers. But that's just one of the of the ways the president has recognized the agency, the environment, and me in the time I've served. And I attend all cabinet meetings. So on that one, I am not going to, uh, I'm not going to repeat the kinds of things I said uh, just 11 or 12 months ago when I was in the private sector, but rather uh, <laughs> uh, content myself to uh, recognize that, that I think we're doing fine on that score. And as far as status and legitimacy are concerned, we have more than enough. Well, that's a wonderful place to end.